okay good morning so this is lecture number 37 and uh, <coughs> today we will talk about specifically the uh, minor losses which are other than the frictional losses in the pipes and then uh, what are the different possibilities for complex pipe networks and then how we can actually solve and do their analysis okay uh, before that just quickly i want to uh, complete <coughs> one topic we are uh, we were actually discussing about the non circular cross sections okay so for non circular cross sections because while we discussed the uh, theory of uh, flow through annulus we found that even if we use the moody uh, diagram but instead of uh, using the hydraulic diameter if we use the effective diameter which is nothing but 64 divided by f into re and multiplied by hydraulic diameter where this f and re are calculated based on the hydraulic diameter okay so then what we get we get the effective diameter and if i simply substitute this effective diameter into the definition of reynolds number and the relative roughness then from moody's diagram itself i can obtain the uh, good values of the friction factor within the accuracy limits of plus minus 15% okay so that is something which we have seen now <clears throat> typically uh, what we need to do so one important point is there if i have to use the definition of this effective diameter then of course this f and re is something which is coming from the lenner theory product of f into re because here you can see f into re based on hydraulic diameter is equal to 96 for b by a equal to 0 if i have rectangular cross section and if i have isosceles triangle then for theta equal to 0 this is 48 okay so the point is that in case of laminar theory we get some constant divided by reynolds number so that particular constant is something which helps us in determining the effective diameter because this f into re i will be replacing with these numbers okay Is this one clear? So whenever I have to use the non-circular geometry, if I have the laminar theory known for that particular circular geometry, then by taking the help of that laminar theory, uh, I can actually get this number f into R e, which will be giving me the effective diameter. Okay, and in case you find very extreme complicated shape for which laminar theory is not known there simply you can use the hydraulic diameter as your parameter for turbulent flow but of course that will be giving uh, the error percentage of plus minus 15% on contrary if you apply the hydraulic diameter concept uh, by using moody diagram for laminar flow then your error will be plus minus 40% okay so <clears throat> two typical non circular cross sections rectangular and isosceles triangular cross section are shown over here and uh, based on the laminar theory for different values of b by a as well as for different values of theta you it is given in the question that what is the product of f into sorry it is given in the table that what is the product of f into r okay so basically this product if you substitute over here you will be getting the effective diameter and then you can simply use the moody's diagram with better accuracy okay and you can see that when you are having non circular flows then in a typical non circular flow there will be actually uh, there will be two situations one is laminar situation other one is turbulent so you you can see <coughs> this is the triangular cross section so in this triangular cross section for laminar flow this is how your velocity profile will be actually appearing okay so at the center you have highest velocity so this is the region of highest velocity then you have slightly low velocity in this region then you have slightly low velocity in this region so this is how you are getting your nothing but velocity contour and same is applicable if you are showing a rectangular cross section from the mid plane only one section of that so this is the zone of highest velocity then zone of slightly low velocity then low velocity and then further low velocity okay on contrary when you have turbulent flow then along with this mean flow of the velocity profile you will be having some turbulent fluctuations also okay 
So you can see over here, because of the turbulent fluctuation, some secondary flows will be developing into the cross section about any mean flow. So these arrows over here shows nothing but the secondary circulations in our flow. Is this point clear? So these arrows nothing but depict the secondary circulations in the flow. So of course, if you consider uh, triangular geometry or any other geometry, you will be finding that everywhere you will be having significant amount of circulations. One uh, <coughs> difference which is there in between the turbulent flow and the laminar flow is that if I consider any edge of my uh, duct, then I will be finding that in case of laminar flow, ultimately at the corners, I will be having zero wall shear stress, but across the length of the edge, there will be significant variation in the wall shear stress. Okay. On contrary, because in the corners, you will be finding almost there will be some stagnant pockets of the flow. So that's why uh, wall shear stress will be zero. Okay. Uh, on contrary, if you talk about turbulent flow, because in turbulent flow, the secondary circulations are inducing most of the flow uh, near the edges. So that's why you will be finding almost a uniform shear stress profile uh, across most of the edge of the <coughs> most of this uh, edge of the duct and then near the corner suddenly it will approach to zero. Okay, so it means that because of this turbulent fluctuations present in the flow, our <coughs> profile of the wall shear stress will be more uh, averaged kind of thing over the complete length of the edge in case of turbulent flow, but in case of uh, laminar flow, it will be having significant variations. Okay, so this is brief about the non-circular cross sections. Now let's discuss the other important topic. So that is uh, actually uh, to estimate the minor losses. Okay, so uh, first let me talk about what does minor losses signify and uh, uh, how we estimate the minor losses. Okay. <clears throat> so the point is when you are having a pipe network you don't have only a single straight piece of length okay you don't have this type of straight piece of length of course whenever you will be having this length along with that you have to also fit a multiple number of components okay for example if you are taking uh, water from a pump then you will be having some pump over here then this pump will be taking the water from some uh, tank, reservoir, and then it will be supplying. And after that, at the end of the pump, I may have some valve. Then I may have some 90 degree elbow over here, L section, which is connected to the pipe. Then in this pipe, I can have some another fitting, pipe fitting, which is actually connecting to some other pipe. Then here I can have some 90 degree bend, which is transferring once again <coughs> water to some uh, other reservoir say over here okay so you can see that though i have significant portion of the straight lengths from here to here then from here to here here to here but along with that i have more other number of pipe fittings also okay for example here i have some valve this is a pump then here I have a 90 degree bend. So this is 90 degree bend. Here 90 degree bend. Here I can say I have some flange which is connecting two pipes. Okay. So likewise, I will be having actually number of other accessories which are connected to the pipe section. Okay. So whenever we are estimating the losses through the pipe section, then we have simply now done we call that as frictional head loss which is equal to fl v square by 2 okay on contrary through these pipe fittings valves bends also there will be some additional pressure drop is this point clear so through all these components there will be some additional pressure drop so what we have to do we have to also quantify this additional pressure drops so effect of these additional pressure drops is something which is called as minor losses. Is this point clear? Okay, so effect of the additional fittings which we are using in the pipe networks, that is, uh, that uh, 
particular the loss because of these additional fittings is something which is called as minor loss. Okay. So <coughs> typically if I have to quantify the minor loss, we simply write it some k as some coefficient times v square by 2g. So this is the typical representation for the minor losses in the pipes. Okay. So if this is the typical representation for minor losses in the pipe, uh, then of course this is not for all fittings. So if you have a valve, then for one valve it will be k times v square by 2g, k1 times v square by 2g. If you have some 90 degree bend, then k2 times v square by 2g. If you have some other fledge, then for fledge there will be some other value of the coefficient k3, k3 times v square by 2g. Okay. So now, if I have to find out now the friction uh, losses or the head loss, then head loss will be equal to frictional loss, which is F L V square by 2 G D. Okay. Plus, I will be having some loss because of the K V square by 2 G, which is the minor loss. Okay. And of course, if I have n number of pipe fittings, then the k into v square by 2g will appear n number of times. Okay, so that's why for say n number of pipe fittings, I can write it uh, i varies from 1 to n and ki into v square by 2. Is it one here? And then I am using over here summation sign because I, I can have multiple. <coughs> fittings. So then I can write my HF to be the generic formula for head loss in a pipe can become V square by 2G times FL by FL by D plus summation of K. So it means that till now whatever we have studied that was for the fundamental understanding that what is happening in a pipe to the flow and how we can determine the friction factor. But whenever we have to go for the practical perspective, we have to consider all these uh, minor losses also which are coming because of the pipe fittings. Okay. So this is the more generic formula. One very, very important point I would like to highlight over here that in majority of the scenarios where number of pipe fittings are less, we will be finding that the magnitude of these losses k into v square by 2g will be significantly smaller in comparison to the frictional losses. Okay, so that's why for many situations this can be neglected. That is the reason we call these minor losses. But one important question we should consider that we should not think that these are so minor that these cannot become comparable to that of the frictional losses. Okay. For example, if you have a very complex pipe network where a number of pipe fittings are connected, okay, and the length of the pipe is very small, but the number of pipe fittings are huge. So, in these scenarios, you may find that the minor losses which are coming because of the pipe fittings, these may even be larger than the frictional losses. Is this one clear? So this caution we should consider. Now let's consider that what type of uh, different fittings uh, we may have. So <clears throat> typically in a pipe network, even if you see in your home appliances, valve is very, very important component which we see in majority of the places. So in our home appliances, we are having uh, generally two types of valves, ball valve and globe valve. But Whenever you will be going into the industrial scenario, there you may find a uh, number of valves arrangements. So, for example, this is a kind of a globe valve over here. So, here you are closing and uh, then uh, if you keep on rotate this spindle, then it will move downward and it will close this path. And if you rotate it in the reverse direction, then it will be opening. Now, I told you that in case of... Uh, Valves, what we have, we have k as the coefficient. Okay, so depending upon the uh, opening position of the valve, there will be different different values of the k. Okay, then this is second type of valve which is called as 
disc type valve so you can see here it is having with this disc and this disc uh, in the complete closing situation will uh, be here okay so this is bend globe valve this is uh, uh, check valve or uh, unidirectional valve because when the flow is from this side to that side then it will be always in open position but if the flow is in reverse direction then this pressure will act on this point and it will move to this point and here it will close the position so this is called as unidirectional valve or check valve okay so typically this type of unidirectional valves are used at the inlet of the pump okay once you have switched off the pump then you don't want that whatever the water is there in the pipeline or pump casing that should once again return and go into the uh, tank so there we typically put this non return valve okay you may find some other uh, plenty of applications of non return valves uh, then this is typically once again a disc type valve so here you can see when we are moving this disc down then depending upon the opening area so this much portion shaded portion is actually closed portion and remaining portion is the open portion and depending upon these openings uh, we will be finding that log coefficients will be actually changing okay so here these are the typical values of k for uh, different uh, valves and the two arrangements of valves are there few valves are screwed valves and few are flanged valves so you can see in case of flanged valve there will be some uh, side flange on the two ends of the valve and the pipe where you are fitting these valves on that pipe also there should be some flange and then you use some nut bolt arrangement to fix the valve okay so typically flange type valves are used in larger diameter pipes on contrary if you have smaller diameter pipes like you see in your uh, home appliances okay uh, so there you will be finding that valves are typically the thread type valves okay so you can see the tap which is connected to your uh, say sink that is having threads arrangement and these are screwed to some uh, fixer okay so uh, depending upon the nature of the valve whether it is a screw type arrangement or whether it's a flange type arrangement and depending upon the different nominal diameters when these diameters are measured in inches uh, you can see that flange type valves their uh, diameter is starting from 1 inch to 20 inches whereas for screw type it is only from 1 inch to 4 inch okay and there you can see for different valves if valve is fully open then these are the values of k for globe valve gate valve and this and whenever you are finding that uh, okay so these values are nothing but given for the fully opened conditions then if you have elbows so elbow means if you have some bend so that bend can be at different different angles one bend can be at 45 degrees angle so if you have 45 degrees angle then this is like this if you have 90 degree angle then this is like this so depending upon the angles uh, you will be finding that different different values of coefficients are actually given over here okay then if you have t section so t section is nothing but a junction from where you connect pipelines like this okay so this type of junction is called as t junction so here also you can connect one pipe here also you can connect and here also you can connect so here then you you can calculate these particular coefficients okay so this table you can refer to calculate the value of k whenever you find that you are having the presence of a valve and depending upon the type of the valve and the bend but what you need to do you need to multiply this with upstream velocity square by 2g in order to calculate the final loss okay so this k factor you can see now <coughs> basically these values of k are very very sensitive why sensitive because depending upon the openings these are changing depending upon the flow conditions also these can change and at the same point of time if we consider that two valves are of same type but these are fabricated by two different manufacturers then depending upon their manufacturing also the values of k can change okay so these are very sensitive values so that's why uh, typically whenever we will be finding experimentally the values of k 
Of course, whatever the data we are showing over here, these are nothing but experimentally calculated data. And typically, when you purchase a valve, the manufacturer of valve specifies this sweater to you. So, <coughs> if you see, this K factor is plotted over here as the function of Reynolds number for three different types of arrangements. One is plastic elbow, metal elbow, and second is metal elbow, but same type, but from some different manufacturer. Okay, so you can see, this is how the values are scattering. Values are not following a unique curve. So, though you can fit a power law relation over here, uh, that K is equal to 1.49 into Reynolds number power minus 0.145, but this is not perfectly fitting because you have significant scatter of data about this universal curve. And you can see over here, the uh, range of error associated is about plus minus 10%, okay? And typically, all these loss coefficient curve which I am showing over here, this is applicable for a 90 degree elbow. Okay. Then similarly, uh, you can see the average loss coefficient for partially opening of the wall. So you can see in one of the previous diagram, to indicate the opening, we have D as the diameter and H as the portion of the extruded portion either disc or globe which is actually closing the section of the pipe. So depending upon the fraction of H by D, I can, uh, H by D, I can define whether the valve is fully open or <coughs> is it, it is in the closed position. Okay, so when H by D is equal to 1, then it is in the fully closed position. When H by D equal to 0, then it is fully open and in between actually we can say the partially open valve. So for different values of H by D, which are varying from 0.25 to 1, you can see how uh, for gate, disc and globe wall, my coefficient, loss coefficient is actually changing, okay. And you can clearly see that whenever we have the, whenever we have the more restricted openings of the wall, then value of K is large and when we are relaxing the restriction, then actually value of K is decreasing and one important point, significant variation is in the portion of when openings are very small. When openings are more than 50%, then variation in the loss coefficient almost becomes independent. Okay. So the meaning is that if you have a valve and if you slightly open the valve in the initial position, then you will be finding significant variation in the flow rate also if you have a constant head. Okay. On contrary, if you have open the wall from more than 50% position, then if you still keep on opening the wall, you will not find much variation in the flow rate. Okay. So, <clears throat> that is something which is evident from this K also. Okay. Then this is another type of wall which is called as butterfly wall. Okay. So, in case of butterfly wall, you have some vertical spindle and to this spindle one disc is connected and this disc keeps on rotates, rotating at an angle. So if you recall, uh, in case of our uh, uh, car engines also, or any automobile engine, this wall is actually popularly used to regulate the flow of incoming air. When we say in older arrangements, so it was having significant control when the carburetors were used in the engine. Okay, so then, then depending upon the position of a butterfly valve only, our amount of air fuel was being controlled, which was going into the engines. So depending upon the uh, now this butterfly wall because uh, its opening will be completely dependent upon the angle at which it is, okay. So that's why for uh, obtaining the loss coefficients we are using here wall openings in terms of angle parameter, okay. So when angle is 20 degree it means it is very much restricted. So then you have high loss coefficient and when angle is actually going to 90 degree then loss coefficient is becoming very small. Is this one here? But one important point you can note over here that in case of globe wall, disc wall, and gate wall, the variation of K was non-linear. Okay, so near the uh, very tight openings, this values was large, but whenever the wall opening is greater than 50%, then value rate of uh, decrease in the value of loss, loss coefficient has decreased. Okay, on contrary, for butterfly wall, for majority of the duration, almost for the entire duration, our trend is linear. So because of which, we will be finding that, because
because of which we will be finding that butterfly valves are more useful to control the flow for their entire range. So it can be almost uniform linear relationship with the flow rate. Okay. <coughs> then this is typically a 90 degree bend and uh, this bend can have different R by D. R is radius of the bend and D is diameter of the bend. Okay. So depending upon different R by D and different roughness value, these are the values of loss coefficient. And typically, you have to remember one thing, when you are talking about a bend, <coughs> then this is the resistance coefficient only because of the secondary flow pattern which is induced because of the bend. Okay. So for the bends, typically you will be finding two types of diagrams are given in the book. Okay. So this particular diagram over here is only showing the contribution of the secondary flows which are induced because of the presence of the bends. Okay. So it means that whenever I will be using the loss coefficient from this diagram, then I have to also use additional loss because of the flow along the length of the bend. Because bend can have significant length. So for this much portion of the length of the bend, say if along the axis of the length, this portion, this curve is having length LB. So I have to also use F LB v square by 2g okay to quantify the major loss plus what are the other secondary losses coming because of the presence of the bend that i will be quantifying with k v square by 2g is this one clear if you find certain diagrams there you may find this loss coefficient value is very large in comparison to the one which i have given over here okay so in that type of plot you will be finding they are giving that is the total loss coefficient for a bend Okay. So, in case of total loss coefficient, you need not to separately add the uh, flow along the length portion of the band. Is this one clear? So, you have to be very clear about this because even you see this particular diagram I have taken from the textbook FM White from the newer version of the FM White. So, in newer version, they have shown only the loss coefficient because of the secondary flows. But in older version of the FM White, they are having this uh, uh, loss coefficient based on the total flow, frictional plus the secondary flow. Okay. So whenever you are referring to the curve, you have to clearly understand first the parameter is specified in what fundamental, uh, uh, the, uh, the presence of what fundamental parameters. Okay. And accordingly you have to choose it. Is this point clear? Then, uh, of course, uh, another uh, minor loss is called as entrance and exit loss. What is the meaning of entrance and exit loss? Say you have a large reservoir and from this large reservoir if you have sudden contraction if you have sudden contraction then what will be happening? From here flow streamline will come but it will not be very smooth it will form some neck over here. Okay, and because of this, you will experience some loss over here. So this is called as this is called as entrance loss. Then similar can happen with the exit. Say you have a pipe, and this pipe is giving the flow to a tank. So here also suddenly flow will actually spread like this. So there also it will create some additional loss that is called as exit loss. Okay. So, uh, to see the entrance and exit loss, if you have this type of entrance, which is having say thickness T, length L and V is the velocity which is going into the pipe. So, then you can see depending upon the ratio of this L and D as the diameter of the pipe and ratio of thickness by D, you can see these are the values of low loss coefficients. Okay. And in many cases, what is done, uh, these inlets are provided with some rounded edge. Okay, the reason for providing the rounded edge is if you consider the sharp edge, then sharp edge is having very high value of the loss coefficient. So by providing the rounded edge or the tapered edges, we will be finding that the value of loss coefficient actually decreases. So depending upon the radius of this rounded inlet, 
here you have r by d and depending upon the length of this tapered portion you have l by d over here and for different different values of l by d and r by d you can see that when you are increasing the radius and you are increasing the length of the tapered portion then loss coefficient is actually decreasing up to somewhere 0.2 and after that it almost saturates and if you don't consider these type of uh, uh, these type of rounded or or the tapered inlets and exits then you will be having very high value of the loss coefficient okay this is another uh, <coughs> important thing so you must see in majority of the pipe networks sometimes what happens that at one section you have a smaller pipe and then suddenly you are increasing the diameter and you are entering into a larger pipe portion okay so these are called as sudden expansions and sudden contractions so if you move in this direction then it will become a sudden expansion if you move the flow in reverse direction then it will become nothing but a sudden contraction okay you have larger diameter in the reverse direction and then suddenly you are going to the smaller diameter so then it becomes the case of a sudden contraction okay so uh, you can see over here this loss coefficient is plotted for sudden expansion and typically for sudden expansion it can be represented uh, this loss coefficient can be represented as 1 minus small d square by capital d square and whole square of this okay and uh, for sudden contraction you will be finding that up to d by d close to 0.76 okay this will follow some different curve 0.42 times of 1 minus d square by d square and after this point then our diameters become so comparable that sudden expansion and contraction both almost gives the same loss <coughs> coefficient okay and typically you can see that when you have a sudden expansion then your main flow will be moving in this direction but there will be some recirculatory pockets and these recirculatory pockets will create some additional losses okay so these are accounted for by using these coefficients. Is this one clear? So typically for sudden expansion you need not to even refer to the curve you can directly calculate loss coefficient by using this formulation and for contraction you can calculate by using this up to d by d of 0.76. So less than equal to 0.76 and above than that only that relation will be applicable. Okay. Then you have one more section. So instead of sudden, you may have gradual. Okay. So when you have gradual expansion and uh, gradual contraction, then depending upon the angle. So this two theta is nothing but angle. Okay. Depending upon this angle, you will be finding uh, for if you consider that fully developed inlet flow, it means at the inlet itself you have a fully developed laminar profile. Then this will be your loss coefficient curve but if you consider that at the inlet profile is not developed but you have the growth of boundary layer okay so you have developing flow at the inlet then you will be having this one as the uh, loss coefficient okay uh, one simple thing we have to consider over here whenever we are referring to this uh, formulation so these curves can also be given by 1 minus d14 by d24 minus cp where the cp is nothing but p2 minus p1 by half rho v1 square okay so these two curves can be uh, given by this relation hm k is loss coefficient can be given as 1 minus d14 by d24 for the gradual expansions and contractions minus cp where cp is nothing but pressure at section 2 minus pressure at section 1 divided by half rho v1 square okay so typically you have to take care of this thing when you have a diffuser section then ultimately what will be happening if you have a diffuser section then what will be happening here in this portion there will be decrease in kinetic energy and recovery in the pressure Okay. So, if you have recovery in the pressure, you cannot go for very extremely large diffuser angle. If you go for extremely large diffuser angle, then because of the uh, pressure recovery, there come 
another issues of boundary layer separation, etc. These I will talk in the subsequent lectures. Okay, so that's why diffuser angle, this two theta should not be very large. At the same point of time, two theta should not also be very very small. If two theta is very very small, though one advantage you can see that if your two theta is less than ten degrees, then you are having very small value of the logs coefficient. Okay, but it is having some practical issues that if you keep very small angle, then you have to consider a long, larger length portion in order to go for the complete expansion. Okay, so that is something which is a practical limitation when you design majority of the components. Okay, in real scenarios. <clears throat> so for gradual contractions, so this was for the gradual expansion, and for gradual contraction, if you have 30 degree, 45 degree, 60 degree values, then these. Uh, values of k are actually quoted over here and if you have any other angle in between these then you can simply choose the uh, you can simply choose the <coughs> uh, use the interpolation method to determine that value okay now let's try to see that what are the different possibilities for piping systems which we can have so <coughs> one of the possibilities i can have si uh, pipes of multiple lengths and sizes in series so you can see this is the series combination okay so this is first pipe of some d1 diameter second pipe is of d2 diameter and third is of d3 diameter and we are having the flow from a1 a point a to point b and three different pipes are designated by one two and three okay then second possibility i can have in a pipe network is i have one junction uh, two junctions a and b and in between these two junctions i have number of pipes which are connected actually back okay then third possibility I can have that I have a junction and at this junction I have three pipes which are connected to this but these three pipes are actually connected to their respective reservoirs. Okay, so these are the three generic scenarios which you will be finding in majority of the complex pipe network in the real practical applications. Okay, <clears throat> so how to solve this? Let's see when you have pipes in series so of course in series combination if I have to calculate the head loss from point A to point B so I have to consider uh, uh, first V1 square by 2G into F1 L1 by D1 this is the frictional loss in the first pipe plus summation of K1 so all minor losses which are associated to the first pipe then plus V2 square by 2G plus F2 L2 D2 plus summation of K2 where K2 is nothing but all minor losses which are connected to the uh, second pipe and similarly submission K3 is all minor losses which are connected to the third pipe. Okay, one simple thing if you further simplify these coefficients it means if you combine this summation <coughs> K1, summation K2, summation K3 and represent all velocities only in terms of V1 because in this scenario what will be happening flow rate through pipe 1 will be equal to flow rate through pipe 2 will be equal to flow rate through pipe 3 okay so because of this reason I can tell that v1 into d1 square will be equal to v2 into d2 square pi by 4 I am cancelling out and v3 into d3 square okay so means all the velocities can be expressed in terms of v1 so if I express all the velocities in terms of v1 so I can take v1 square by 2g as common and then I will be getting some values of constants so because of all summation k's I will be getting some constant alpha naught and for all other things I will be getting alpha 1 f1 plus alpha 2 f2 plus alpha 3 f3 okay. So now by using this series pipe network what type of uh, uh, numerical problems we can have that let's try to see okay. So let's consider that we have uh, three pipe series system so three pipe series system as shown in the previous diagram okay and the total pressure drop pa minus pb is 1 lakh 50 thousand pascals so total pressure drop is given pa minus pb static pressure difference is 1 lakh 50 pascals and elevation drop z a minus z b between junctions a and b that is 5 meters so one small difference is from the previous formulation in previous formulation all the pipes are shown in horizontal arrangement so ZA minus ZB is 0 but here this is tilted and ZA is at higher elevation and ZA minus ZB is 5 meters 
Is this one clear? Then the pipe data are given. So there are three pipes. First pipe is having length of 100 meter, second is 150 meter, third is 80 meters, and diameters are 8 centimeter, 6 centimeter, and 4 centimeters. Roughness is also given for each, and also the relative <coughs> roughness epsilon by root. Okay. And <clears throat> the fluid which we are using is having density 1000 kg per meter cube, kinematic viscosity 1.02 into 10 to the power minus 6 meter squares per second. And we have to calculate the flow rate in meter cubes per hour through the system. Okay. So how we can calculate it? Please tell me. What is the first thing we need to do? What is head loss? What is total head loss? If I have to calculate delta H from A to B, what it, it will be? If we refer to the very generic definition of the head loss, it is nothing but PA minus PB by rho G plus delta Z, which is Z A minus Z. First, I have to estimate the total head loss. Let me do this. So if I estimate the total head loss, I will be getting that it is PA minus PB by rho G plus ZA minus ZB. So if you calculate it means it is 20.2 meters. Okay. Once I have calculated this head loss, what I need to do next? <coughs> Please tell me. What I need to do next? What is the next step? <coughs> You don't know the velocities, you don't know the friction factor. Okay, but what you need to do, you know the roughness. So we have to go for some iterative procedure. So now what I will be doing, I will assume that my pipe is totally rough. If I enter into totally rough reason, then the dependence of Reynolds number will become Venice. Okay, so that will be vanishing. Once the dependence of Reynolds number has vanished, my friction factor is only dependent upon epsilon by root. Okay, so what I will do now, I will go to the total rough reason where friction factor is constant and independent of the Reynolds number. And for this rough reason, I will assume that for all these roughness values, considering the completely rough pipe, I will determine the values of friction factor from the moving diagram. Is this my clear? Because we have to go in some iterative procedure. So the starting guess, I am considering that I am taking the help of roughness by completely eliminating the dependence of Reynolds number. Okay. So that is what I have done. So okay, before that, this correlations of velocity are shown over here. So say V2 will be D1 square by D2 square, so it means 16 by 9 of V1. Similarly, V3 will be 4 times of V1. And if you apply the same formulation for Reynolds number, then RE2 will be 4 by 3 of RE1 and RE3 will be 2 times of RE1. So this is the simple geometric manipulation based on the continuity equation, conservation of mass. Okay. So <clears throat> second is uh, what we are doing, we are writing this equation of head loss only for the major losses okay only for the major losses why uh, we have neglected the minor losses in this arrangement so if we neglect the minor losses then of course v1 square by 2d into f l by d so for first pipe l is 100 d is 8 centimeter so 8 centimeter means 0 0.08 so 100 by 0 0.08 is 12 kg okay for second pipe, 150 by 0 0.06. So that will be coming this coefficient. But then I have to also use the formulation of velocity. Because with second, it would have been V2 square by 2G. But V2 square now I have converted with 16 by 9 into V1 square. That's why to this 2500, I am also multiplying 16 by 9 whole square. This one clear. Similarly, for V3, I have to write 4 times of V1, so 4 square into 80 by 0 0.04, which is 2000. Okay, so ultimately you will be getting the 20.3 is equal to V1 square by 2z and this. So now, if I have to solve this equation, of course, I need to calculate V1. 
Once I calculate V1, then only I will be able to calculate the flow rate Q. Okay. So for calculating V1, I must know the values of F1, F2 and F3. Okay. And for knowing the values of F1, F2 and F3, what I need to do? I need to do a guess and that guess I am telling that first we will take the completely rough pipe. So if you go to the completely rough region of your Moody's diagram and just see these roughness values, you will be getting the values of F1, F2 and F3. Once you have F1, F2 and F3, you can calculate the value of your V1 is coming out to be 0.58 meters per second. Okay. And then you can calculate Renault's number. Okay. Once you have Reynolds number, now for next iteration you have two data. You have Reynolds number also, you have roughness also. So now you can consider these roughness as well as the Reynolds number and you can calculate the new values of F1, F2 and F3 from the Moody's diagram. Is this one clear? So these are the new values of F1, F2, F3 which are also including the dependence of Reynolds number. Now see one clear indication. In all cases, values of friction factor has increased. What is the meaning of that? We have entered from fully independent turbulent resign to the resign where Reynolds number is actually dependent upon, friction factor is dependent upon Reynolds number. Okay, so I have entered the portion of the <clears throat> Moody diagram where value of friction factor is increasing when we are decreasing the Reynolds number. So that's why all these values has increased. Okay. So now with, with these new friction factors, I can calculate the new value of the velocity. Is this one clear? So new value of the velocity is 0.565. And with this velocity, if you calculate flow rate, that is 10.2 meter cube per hour. Why I have stopped over here? Because if I further calculate the Reynolds number based on this velocity and if I again calculate the new friction factors and if I again then calculate the flow rate, I will be finding flow rate in the next iteration as 10.22 meter cube per hour. So the difference is very very small. So it means my solution has convinced. Is this point clear? Now here it seems very easy that I have shown all the steps. We have not used friction factor because that data is already given over there. But ultimately whenever a question will come in the exam, you have to refer to the Moody's diagram. You have to find friction factor. You have to think that how I should write head equation. You have to think that there are multiple unknown so what form you should write for that what is needed practice okay so because in the class when i do numerical problems then it's very easy straightforward but whenever you have to do in the exam unless or until you are having practice you will not be able to do it okay and this is just a simple problem when pipes are in series in exam you may expect some combination where series is also there, parallel is also there, junction is also there. A complex pipe network. Okay. If you want to just see, though I will stop at this point, but one complex network I have included in the last slide. So you can see your network may be as complex as like this. Okay. More lectures. This is 37. So five more. Because we have 42 lectures no? and if say uh, in academic calendar they have provided more than 42 then whatever as per calendar. Okay. <coughs> Sorry.